Our speaker tonight is my good colleague and friend, Peter Barber, who has had a long and distinguished career working at the British Library. Although he retired from the British Library this past summer, he is currently a visiting professor at King's College, London. He's also president of the International Map Collector Society and is involved with the digitization of George III's papers, which are in the Royal Library in Windsor. I present to you Peter Barber speaking about the colonies in context, the place of North America in King George's worldview. Peter. Um, I want you to go back to a rainy day, it was doubtless rainy, in November 1784 when George III had left for Windsor Castle but had allowed some visitors to go around what is now Buckingham Palace and was then the Queen's Palace, as you can see in the slide. This, there we are, there it is. The person who went round was deeply impressed by everything he saw in the palace. But he was particularly impressed by the things you can see in this wing, and particularly the building that is highlighted, and here it is, the library. He wrote in his diary that the King's Library struck me with admiration. I wished for a week's time, but had only a few hours. The books were in perfect order, elegant in their editions, paper, bindings, etc., but gaudy and extravagant in nothing. They were chosen with perfect taste and judgment. Every book that a king ought to have always at hand, and as far as I could examine and could be supposed capable of judging, none other maps, charts, etc., of all his dominions in the four corners of, quarters of the world and models of every fortress in his empire. In every apartment of the whole house, the same taste, the same judgment, the same elegance, the same simplicity, without the smallest affectation, ostentation, profusion, or meanness. Now, the person saying that was your second president, John Adams. And he was not alone in his high opinion of George III as a patron of the arts. The astronomer William Herschel wrote to Sir Joseph Banks, who was the patron of Cook and no mean botanist in his own right in the previous year, that George III was the best of kings, who is the liberal protector of every art and science. And Banks responded to Herschel, was every kingdom blessed with a sovereign as capable of distinguishing and as ready to reward merit as ours is, philosophy would indeed be a fashionable study. So you see, there is an alternative view of King George. Now, Ron tells me that... Adams was not particularly interested in globes and in the maps which featured in his portrait, but clearly either he or John Singleton Copley was aware of the symbolic value of maps. George III was a complete map junkie. He was addicted to map, maps from his earliest years. As a child of just six, he was playing with jigsaw puzzles which were cut up maps. Here you see him at the age of 14. And by the time that John Adams visited him, he had his maps in this library. And you can see the globes, you can see the volumes, you can see the rolls. Most of these are now, well, all of them, in fact, including the globes, are in the British Library. But what is particularly remarkable is if you look at the plan of Buckingham Palace, 
Here you can see where he had his library, and if you look carefully, you will see it is right next door to his bedroom. And that is a sign of just how keen he was on his collection, on, on, on his collection of maps. And indeed, a contemporary said that topography is one of the king's favourite studies. He copies every capital chart, takes models of all celebrated fortifications, knows the soundings of the chief harbours of Europe and the strong and weak sides of most of the fortified towns. And he amassed a collection of about 50,000 maps, charts and views. Now, many of these he inherited from his ancestors. And indeed, that collection was started under Charles II, and if you like, the first item in the collection, and this is my Alfred Hitchcock moment, <laughs> is the largest antiquarian globe uh, atlas in the world. This was presented to Charles II on his restoration by a group of Dutch merchants. Now, I don't have time to tell you how the collection came together, but suffice it to say that he gathered together a lot of material that he, that he had inherited from his ancestors. But to that, he added material that he purchased, particularly at the beginning of his reign, and material that was presented to him. But it went beyond that. George was a great collector. I mean, he was a sort of made to be a collector. So he had collections of paintings and scientific instruments and you name it, he collected it. But in most cases, he left the collecting to experts. This was not the case with his map collection. Here, he was very, very personally involved. And how do we know it? Well, I'll show you how we know it. Because he kept material that was passed to him as king and was really meant for return to, to the ministers. And indeed, if you go to the National Archives in England, you will find numerous dispatches with a sad comment, enclosures missing. Well, the enclosures are with us because George just filched them. <laughs> and this is one of the items that he filched. It's Captain Cook's sketch of Saint-Pierre Miquelon in, in the St. In the St. Lawrence, which was prepared for the Admiralty but kept by George. And here we see the earliest view of Sydney, done by a professional artist, which was actually made for the Home Secretary, but retained by George. And here we get a sort of predecessor of the original Ordnance Survey maps of England. It's a map of St. Helier on the Channel Islands, which during the Revolutionary War was threatened by capture by the French, there's a map, should have been in the war office, but George liked it and kept it for himself. But he wasn't only taking things from official records. Here you see his own plan of Kew Gardens, where he had a palace. And here you see his root book, that was to take him from Windsor Castle to his holiday resort in Weymouth. And here you see his bathing machine in Weymouth, where the royal body was carried into the water for health reasons. And like every good father, he treasured the little sketches of his children. Like this plan of a defence done by his favourite son, Adolphus, the original Duke of Cambridge. So, in other words, King George's topographical collection was a very personal thing. And I'd argue that if you study it properly, you get a better idea than from most other sources of the way that George's mind worked. And that's why, in this lecture, I want to see how much it can tell us about George's attitude towards his American colonies. Well, let's begin 
with the breakdown of the whole collection. And what will immediately strike you is that America is only 2% of the whole and is far outshadowed by Great Britain, of course, with 35%, Italy with 10%, France with 8%, Germany with 8%, and the Netherlands with 7%. Now, in part you could say, well, that's due to the fact that all of these countries in Europe were much more advanced and, if you like, civilised. They had bigger printing industries. It's not surprising that they had more maps and views. Well, to an extent, that's true. But there was more to it than that. There's a breakdown by number, and again, it emphasises how small a part North America plays in the overall picture. But there were good reasons why you got these percentages. Obviously, England was home for George. It represented something like 25% of the total collection. And here you see Windsor Castle drawn by one of his daughters. Here you get a great ceremony in Whitehall with King George himself appearing on the sort of balcony dressed in red. This is a ceremony that still takes place in England every Maundy Thursday when money is given to as many, as many pennies are given to as many poor people as the king or queen is years old. And here you've got what was then Brightonston and became better known as Brighton, an up-and-coming seaside resort. So in other words, England was home and it's not surprising that George wanted to be reminded of it. When we moved to Scotland, there were mixed motives. This is one of, well, it's a very interesting watercolour by Paul Sandby, who is best known as the so-called founding father of the School of English Watercolourists, but he was also a map maker. And this shows a surveying party in Loch Rannoch at a time when Scotland was being mapped in detail. And we'll come back to that later. But what you can also see in this watercolour is the beauty of Scotland. And that is something that you find emphasised increasingly in the collection. When we got to Wales, you get a similar sort of thing. Wales is remote, it is beautiful, it has medieval castles, and it represents the idea of Rousseauan simplicity. Ireland features, but for other reasons. Ireland, then almost as now, is a security problem. And here you see a map, an extremely rare map, dedicated to Queen Anne's husband, but you will see that the decoration is entirely military showing the layout of forts. So that's why Britain, Great Britain is represented a lot. But how about Italy? Well, Italy is, of course, the home of the Grand Tour. And this is a drawing by Bernardo Bolotto, Canaletto's nephew, showing the sorts of the, the, one of the towns which the English Grand Tourist would have visited. And this is a map from an atlas which George tried as a young man to obtain almost at all costs because it showed the places like Tivoli and Hadrian's Villa near Rome which the Grand Tourist visited. George never did the Grand Tour but the collection makes it quite clear that he made a virtual Grand Tour through his map collection. And of course what did tourists do, they visited ancient remains. And here are some contemporary tourists visiting what they thought was a temple is now thought to be the Forum in Pozzuoli near Naples. So Italy is so important to the culture of the 18th century that almost inevitably there is an awful lot about it. France is a different matter. 
France is our traditional enemy, or England's traditional enemy, and represents a threat. So here we have a map of the French borders stolen from the French National Archives, round about 1680, and showing the sorts of ways in which the British, if they tried hard, might invade France in necessity. The Netherlands, too, was a place of great security interest to Britain, so the collection is absolutely full of plans of fortresses in the Netherlands like this. And the interest continues. Here we see a plan of Metz in 1760, and on the back of it, there is this little note, which not only pinpoints the importance of the plan, but has a little notice at the bottom stating that His Royal, Royal Highness paid five guineas for this information from the spy. So all of this is material lifted from the French National Archives. But it's not only defence that's of interest in France. Increasingly, the British recognised that French culture was something that was extremely important. And here's one image of a cultural institution in Paris. In the collection, it is replicated heaven knows how many times. But it, again, shows George's image of, of France. But how about Germany? Well, this is a shilling of George III. All of the letters represent titles of his, most of them German, and though at the top you've got the English coat of arms and underneath it you've got the Irish coat of arms and on the right you've got France, of which England continued to put claims on, it's on the left that you get his Hanoverian coat of arms. And as far as George was concerned, he might have been a good Englishman, but he was also very much a German prince. This is a map of the favourite hunting ground of his, grand, of his great grandfather, George I, embellished with George I's portrait. Here is the cover of a book of plans of palaces in Hanover, which George frequently thought of going over to, to, to visit. And this is an extract of the detailed survey of Hanover that he ordered as king. And here you see a detail showing just how good that survey was, really high quality. So George is interested in Germany largely because, as well as being King of England, he was ruler of Hanover. But there's also another way of looking at the collection, and that is from the standpoint of George as a person. Now, in 1788, George commissioned Benjamin West and he actually quite liked American artists, to decorate the drawing room of the Queen at Windsor with allegories based on his particular interests. And I've listed these particular interests and tried to see how far they're reflected in the collection. Well, one allegory was of architecture, and here is an architectural sketch done by George III himself. The collection also includes probably the largest archive of architectural drawings by one of the greatest English architects of all time, Nicholas Hawksmoor, who's famous for his churches in the east of London. And this is a, his design for one of those churches. And here you get a design by the, English, by the Scottish architect Robert Adam of a proposed entrance to London. And a design or a drawing, an elevation of a palace in, in Germany. In fact, it was a palace of his, of his wife's family in Strelitz. But his interest extended historically too. And the, art, and the collection contains some marvellous drawings of buildings and of forts, as in this case, by the Roman architect Carlo Fontana from the late 17th century. So architecture is well represented. 
George is also interested in gardens, and there are innumerable plans like this, usually by John Rock, of famous gardens in Great Britain. But not only famous formal gardens, occasionally there's a really charming watercolour of a garden in the neighbourhood of London. The whole of the area in the background now is completely covered with uh, suburban sprawl. And George took an active interest in gardening. This is, these are a series of plans of developments in Windsor Great Park. Now, linked to an interest in gardening is also an interest in botany, and this too is represented. This is a plan of the Physic Garden in Chelsea, which still survives. But you will notice on the right, there is a representation, a botanical plant shown. And here you appear to get a view of Jamaica, but in fact what makes it interesting is that particular emphasis is laid on these two plants, which are identified. Their, their species is identified. And that, I think, is something that made this particular print particularly attractive to George. So there's architecture, gardens, botany, but George is also interested in British antiquity. And this is a fairly typical example, you know, the romantic rendering of a medieval English fort, an attempt more or less to convey the idea that British antiquity was as, as good as classical antiquity any day. And with this belief in British antiquity went an interest in history painting, which incidentally tended to commission from Benjamin West and from John Singleton Copley. But here's a good example in the King's collection of King Henry III renewing and confirming Magna Carta. This was actually a slightly seditious print, but because it was issued during the course, or printed in, in the course of the American War of Independence, and there were obvious echoes about freedom of independence, American uh, independence of the colonies. And this particular print, inter interestingly enough, is not dedicated to some king or to some prince, it is dedicated to the people of England. So it's actually quite revolutionary, and it's interesting that despite that, George felt it was worth acquiring it. But to balance that, you've got this history print of George at the ceremony celebrating his recovery from insanity in 1789. And here you have what we can also see in the rest of the collection, a real interest in great works of art, in this case, Raphael's School of Athens in the Vatican. And the interest in art wasn't confined to the Renaissance by any means. George was also very interested in, in modern watercolours, and he actually had this watercolour copied by the artist, having seen an original of it, in an art display. But one thing that is particularly significant with George is his interest in industry. And in the, in, among the collection, there is quite a lot reflecting this. Here you see a very cheap... This is, again, very typical of the king. So long as there's an image, he doesn't much care where it comes from. This is an image of the Worcester porcelain manufactory, even though it actually is an advert for a sale of the stuff, which will be taking place very soon. Here we see an image of coal mining in the north of England on a map of the collieries. Here we see a mine or a factory in the south of Wales. And weaving 
in Ireland. And a machine for creating sluices in Germany, in his Hanoverian dominions. And here, and you can see it from the decorative cartouche, a map of a factory producing mirrors in Germany. And here a plan, a detail of it, showing the living conditions, or the, the, the places where the factory workers actually lived and their gardens and communal spaces. George is really interested. And he's interested in agriculture. He's famously known as Farmer George, and the collection has got lots of estate maps like this. But it also has estate maps like this, which relate to George's own grounds. This is Cranbourne Chase in Windsor Forest, close to Windsor Castle. And when we look at a detail, you can see that the purpose is a rationalisation of boundaries. So George is very interested in, to, in the real details of farming. And he's interested in woods, in forests. This map is a map of, one of, of a forest in his German domains which had been destroyed, more or less, in the course of the Seven Years' War. And the map illustrates a tract on how this forests could be brought back into, could be replanted and brought back into use again. And here we see, or we're going to have a few things relating to communications, because George is very interested not only in trade, but also in how things communicate, how you can maximise industrialisation. Here you've got the um, the Starport, the Starport porcelain manufacturer, but please note you've got bridges and you've got canals. And this is of great interest to, um, to George. This is a plan of an intended canal in the vicinity of Kiev. And here is a plan of a proposed dock which was ultimately created in London with lettering all around from the proposers telling him exactly what needed to be done and hoping that he would support, he would order his MPs in Parliament to support the proposal. And George is interested in science. This is a design of an, of an observatory that he commissioned in, in, in Richmond. This is done by one of the, the Adams brothers. And here is an observatory in his Hanoverian dominions. Now, Science means not only astronomy, it also means, particularly at that time, map-making. And it was George who made sure that he obtained Sandby and William Roy's detailed survey of Scotland. This is an extract from it. He also acquired the detailed survey by Charles Valency of the ports of Ireland, of which this is an extract. He supported Cook and received drawings from George Vancouver of his discoveries. But above all, George was king. And so not surprisingly, in the collection, there is an emphasis on defence. This here is the Tower of London in 1725. Here you see Port, the area of Portsmouth in 1751. You've got plans for forts overseas, like, for instance, this plan relating to Port Royal in Jamaica. Or this plan relating to the defence, you can see the fort there, of India. So we've seen what interested George and what, was, what were George's interests. So how did this relate to North America? Well, here you see a breakdown of his American maps and views. And you'll immediately see that the vast majority is concerned with defence and with actually geographical discovery. 35% are just geographical maps. 40%, in one way or the other, are military. 
and then there is the rest. And how does this translate? Well, it translates into plans like this by Joseph Blanchard of New Hampshire. It's a plan that he acquired in 1761, and quite miraculously, we still have the receipt for it. And why did he get it? Because it has information like this on it. Detailed information about the nature of the country, what was known, what had happened. It's a sort of thing that he needed to know in order to have a grip on the country. And here you get another typical map, a map of the campaigns of General, General Abercrombie in 1758, again combining geographical information with military information. Not surprisingly, he also took a, a great interest in the development of Pittsburgh. But earlier on, it had been the southern states that had really been in, in the forefront of threats from France and from the Indians. And so the collection has some early maps of fortifications created for the new colony of Georgia. Now, needless to say, when the War of American Independence came along, you get a great increase in the number of charts and maps. Here you have the seat of war in New England, 1775. And here, a view which you can see the original of in the exhibition, Boston. And you get plans of episodes or places of interest during the war, like this. And like this, with details showing the forts of the American rebels and the redcoats. And it continues in the form of manuscript maps to elucidate what was happening. These, this is a map by Sautier of Philadelphia and in the detail here showing details of the fortifications that were erected in the course of the war. And of course it all finishes up in tears for us <laughs> in Yorktown. However, it's entirely wrong to get the idea that while George is interested in what's going in, on in North America, his interest is purely geographical and purely military. It would be easy to say, well, what I've shown you so far represents things that needed to be paid for. And the things needed to be paid for, in George's opinion, not only by the British, but of course by the Americans. And there we are. Right at the, we're back at, right at the very beginning of the American War of Independence. But as I say, this is misleading. Because, yes, it's true that 70% of the American material relates to geographical discovery and defense. But the majority of the military material is actually pre-1760. And when you look a bit more closely at the material that was acquired by George during his lifetime, the picture begins to vary quite interestingly. You remember that I showed you pictures of Scotland and Wales as romantic Rousseauan wildernesses. Well, there's clear evidence that George viewed America in much the same way. There's a disassembled notebook of watercolours showing places in the United States like this, and Harlem looking very different from what one imagines it to look, look like today. And here again, you get an English engraving of one of the natural wonders in North America. Side by side with this, 
is an increasing interest in the urban structure of America. You get distant views of New York, and of particular interest, you get superb maps of American cities, like this map by Bernard Ratzer of the city of New York of 1767. And you get another interest. I mentioned earlier that George was very interested in gardens. Well, here's a plan by Sautier, who himself began as a, a landscape gardener, of the town of Brunswick in North Carolina. But of particular interest, and I'm sure it would have been of interest to George, and this is the reason why he kept it, is this plan of Governor Tryon's garden. And, of course, he is interested in educational institutions, and here you get this rather well-known print of Harvard. But it's from George's collection. Now, I also, if you remember, mentioned that George was interested in science as expressed in map-making. Well, there is plenty of examples in the American collection of this very interest. He employed de Brown to create all sorts of maps, and they exist in printed and in manuscript form right the way through the collection. You know, these are beautiful examples of precise mapping. George was also behind the work of Debar for the Atlantic Neptune. So what you have is a picture of an emerging interest in the culture and commercial prospects of America in addition to the military and the geographical aspects. Now here, you have the famous red line map of America, which is, as has been said, is the map that was used when drawing the boundaries of America. And of course, it did mean the end of George's dominion in America. But I'd suggest that George accommodated to the loss remarkably speedily, because in the past, a lot of con uh, uh, there's been a lot of concentration on the um, material that was acquired before 1783. People really haven't looked at the material that was acquired after 1783, and there was a fair amount of it. Most notable was this plan here, the, first, the earliest known fire insurance plan, which is a plan of Charleston in South Carolina. And here's a detail. As you can see, it's produced for the Phoenix Insurance Company in London. And it typifies, I think, what George III hoped would be the future relationship with America. This is a London company receiving money from America for the protection of property in America. And I think this is the basis for the future relationship. Now, in 1785, John Adams came over to England as ambassador, and he recorded the words of George III to him. And these words have often been thought of as being less than sincere. I would argue that they were totally sincere. George said to him, I'll be free with you. I was the last to consent to the separation, but the separation having been made and having become inevitable, I have always said that I would be the first to meet the friendship of the United States as an independent power. Now, he saw it. This is not pure philanthropy. I think he saw it with his commercial hat as a commercial opportunity. Now, here is an image of George in his last years. But in 1800, shortly before this portrait was made, he acquired something which actually may interest you. He didn't have to acquire it, but he chose to acquire it. Mount Vernon, 
the home of General Washington. So, ladies and gentlemen, we began with an American president visiting Buckingham Palace. And we finish with George III in spirit visiting George Washington in a spirit of reconciliation and mutual benefit. on the extent to which the king, king personally used these materials uh, for reference as opposed to collecting or having or others use them? Um, about 10, 15 years ago, I was going through that volume of plans of um, palaces in Hanover and found that a slip of paper was inserted into it containing an order of um, service at, at the chapel in Windsor of 1785 and at the back a plan, a, a completely weird plan, of, of a royal palace. Um, it turns out that this plan was in the hand of George III. It was done during his period of madness, and only he could have inserted that particular slip of paper into that volume, which, if you'll remember, was in the room next to his bedroom. So I think there's no question that George was using it. And in fact, when the collection was presented to the British Museum by his son, there was widespread alarm among his courtiers because they said that by handing it over to the British Museum, they would be depriving the British monarch of an essential work of reference. Is that the collection that's in the glass cube uh, in the new uh, British Museum? The collection was given to the British Museum. I was asked about where the collection is. The collection was given to the British Museum between 1824 and 1829 under slightly amusing circumstances. Um, George IV, you saw the original image of, of Buckingham Palace. Well, George wanted to rebuild Buckingham Palace as it is today. And unfortunately, his father's library got in the way. And so he arranged to sell it to the Tsar of Russia, which could cause more or less collective heart failure on the part of the British government. And he was persuaded by the British government that uh, he should present the collection to the British Museum, and in return, the government would pay for his ballroom. So everybody was happy. <laughs> Sorry? Would you talk a little about the process of digitizing all this material? Okay. Well, digitizing is only part of the, of the job. The other part is cataloging. And I think the important thing to remember is that when the material was brought to the British Museum in 1829, all there was was a sort of list, an inventory of what there was. And that inventory has been transformed or has been regarded ever since as a catalogue. It is absolutely hopeless as a catalogue because all sorts of things that you would expect to find in the catalogue simply aren't there. And of course, there are a lot of misidentifications. It was simply intended for people checking through the items to ensure that they're derived. Um, and the weakness of this has become more and more apparent. So about 10 years ago, we started a project to re-catalog, or to catalog properly the whole of the collection, and at the same time to digitize it so that the public could benefit from it. And we've made good progress with, with both. Um, we've done all of the American stuff very much thanks to help from people like the Leventals. Um, but there's an awful lot to do. And we are still seeking for funds from wherever we can because the library has decreed, the British Library has decreed that this should be a private project. So we're receiving no government money. But when you look at the collection, it contains the most marvellous things. And I have to say, we have a very happy bunch of catalogues because Hardly a day goes by without them making a discovery. I mean, material has been grotesquely misidentified. There was a map, for instance, recently that came to light. It had always been described as a map of the rivers of Germany. It turns out to be the unique known example of the Swedish campaigns in, in Germany during the Thirty Years' War. Given George's wide-ranging interest, what do we know about his formal education? He was... Well, his father and mother were incredibly academically ambitious for him. 
and they employed a Swiss tutor called uh, Kaspar Wettstein, who had very advanced ideas. This Kaspar Wettstein was a, a correspondent of people like Leonard Euler and so on, leading mathematicians and astronomers of the time. The official top tutor was the Earl of Bute, who was a polymath with, a, was, with wide ranging interests in the arts and in the sciences. And um, actually, I think George had a bit of a rough time because he was really driven by his tutors. Um, but something did, did last. He was the, as far as I know, the first person in Britain ever to make educational jigsaw puzzles. So, I mean, a, a great effort, a deal of effort was expended on George's education. And I think he always felt slightly guilty that he hadn't made more of it, which is the reason why he really relied on experts in so many other fields and why he felt he had to prove himself to be a patron of, of learning. How much interest did he have in traveling or to visit, visiting the US? Well, this is really interesting because all of the biographies of uh, George III to date have never looked at the topographical collection. And have simply said he was a petty-minded man with a petty-minded view, and he never went further than 100 miles from London. But if you look at the topographical collection, and you realize, and as I, say, as I say, we can actually prove that he looked at it, this was a man who was the born armchair traveler. How long was George's reign? Well, uh, he's, as of last September, he's the third longest reigning British monarch. Uh, the Queen is now the longest reigning British monarch, followed by Queen Victoria, followed by George III, who ascended the throne in 1760, and was still there, though mentally incapacitated, in 1820. So he was there for 60 years, which is not a bad crack of the whip. <laughs> As the vast, complicated clockwork of revolution rolled forward toward a destination that no one could predict, a severing of the bond between Mother England and her colonies, one set of grinding gears and cogs in that machine was a revolution within the revolution. The attempts by these black Americans to throw off the bondage that had been forced upon them.